I talked about the skyscrapers of Chicago, and finally about Tom Beebe's public library, Harold Washington Public Library of 1988, which in a way sums up the whole history of Chicago architecture, which Tom Beebe knows very well. And I pointed out that the buildings of the Loop, and thus building, and that, thus Beebe's building too, finally, were basically chunky masses. They were called skyscrapers, skyscraper construction, but they really weren't very tall. I mean, 9, 10, 11 stories, that would be about it. And as you can see there, the basic type of the loop is that palazzo block that we talked about. And the tall buildings we're seeing there, the really tall skyscrapers, come to Chicago from another tradition, that is the tradition of New York, which I'd like to talk about today. Now, when I first started teaching about skyscrapers in, in, the, in the late 1940s, um, we hardly ever talked about the New York skyscrapers. We, were, we had been trained by modernism not to like them. But we liked the Chicago ones, all right, because people like Gideon in space, time, and architecture had told us that that was really modern architecture, and Sullivan was a modern architect. People like Ayn Rand had written mad books about how Sullivan was a great architect and was destroyed by society and all that kind of thing. And we talked about that. I remember I talked about those maybe as long as I did in this class, at least maybe two lectures. But I came to New York, and I remember I talked about New York in about six skyscrapers, six buildings. And I showed uh, Sullivan's Guarantee Building in Buffalo on one side. Then I showed about six New York skyscrapers to show in each case how they were worse than the Sullivan Building, how they weren't as good as the Sullivan Building. And that can give you an idea of the way style of the times, prejudice, and especially, I think, the very authoritarian aesthetic of modernism in those days, where it was a social good. If you attacked it, you were, you were committing a social evil, uh, could blind our eyes, as it did terribly. And I remember I had a friend, philosopher named Paul Weiss, who said, why don't you talk about the New York skyscrapers? And I said, well, they're not very good. We don't talk about them. And he said, you must be crazy. And of course, I was. So later, I'm happy to say I was one of the early people to write about them. I don't think anyone, though, has written about them as delightfully as Rem Koolhaas in his book, Delirious New York of 1978, which is really a very wonderful book. It makes you understand the excitement and the joy and the madness of the skyscrapers. Because as we saw, as I tried to point out at the end of the hour last time, they have a very different function than the skyscrapers of Chicago. The ones in Chicago, as we saw, were basically intended to uh, have as, basically as much rentable space as possible. There were warehouses and office buildings. Well, so were some of the New York skyscrapers, but their major point was to be seen, was to be tall, was to be seen from a distance. From the very beginning, they have a symbolic function that the Chicago skyscrapers don't have. Now, one reason for that, of course, is the nature of the site. There's Chicago in the bend of the river on the shore of Lake Michigan, bent in by the uh, suburban railway line, and it, it has really not a very dominating position at all. It's just the side of a lake. New York is right at the very tip of Manhattan Island, pointing toward Europe. The very first thing that the immigrants, and remember how important immigration was at this period, when the skyscrapers were growing up, the very first thing the immigrants saw when they came to New York, the very image of America, the image of hope, the image of the metropolis, of a, of a, of a grand new day opening, the skyscrapers carried the burden of all those meanings. And from the very beginning, they're a different type. They're not a palazzo type, but a spire type to be seen from afar. Now, another reason for it, of course, is the nature of the plan. In Chicago, it's a grid as I pointed out all too often. And the buildings partake of the character of that square, static grid. But like the uh, Marshall Field Warehouse down there, they are blocky buildings. They fit right into the shape of the grid. But New York's grid, remember, is not instituted in 1911. And it's a very different kind of grid. It's dynamic. It's very long in this axis. The avenues are long like this and the blocks on the whole going across are short. Everything has a dynamic running north-south up the island or down the island here toward where the skyscrapers grew up, which is right down there in the tip, which is old New Amsterdam. It's Dutch New York. 
And there you have an irregular plan. You don't have a grid. So any group that grows up there is not going to be just that blocky group on the grid, but they're going to be relations to each other, which eventually down there, almost like the shape of the island growing up into three dimensions, they take on a kind of pyramidal organization. As we'll see later, they all build into a kind of great pyramid up here in space. And indeed, the very first buildings that were the tallest that were seen from a distance were spires. There's like the spire right there on Wall Street, right at the end of Wall Street, right at the end of downtown New York. Uh, Trinity Church is rebuilt four or five times. The last time in 1837 by Richard Upjohn, which is still there. You see it's the tallest building. It rises above the basically a conventionally scaled, classical scale of the, of the buildings along Wall Street. And it's the spire that you see from a distance. So what drew people to New York visually when they came in the 18th and early 19th century was just like New Haven. It was the one monumental, seen from afar element in colonial architecture, that is the spire. You see it there in New Haven standing up in front of, in front of East Rock. Now on the other hand, the skyscraper era in New York is ushered in by great gates. It's really wonderful. Downtown New York all of a sudden gets great gates. And this is, of course, the Brooklyn Bridge by the Roebling brothers, by that wonderful martyred family, martyred to the bends, martyred to working down in those caissons under the river under those terrible pressures. As you know, if you haven't read David McCullough's book about the Great Bridge, the building of the bridge, it's really heroic and frightening, and the death toll was terrible, and those poor workers getting off the boat, and then next thing they know, they're down in the caissons in the mud, down under the river with the pressures, giving them the bends and so on, but, but they rise up, and it's from 1867, as you know, until finished about 1883. And its, it's uh, towers were criticized by Montgomery Schuyler, who was the best known architectural critic of the period, because they weren't round. That was the Richardsonian era, after all, when he's writing in 1883. They weren't round arched. But of course, that wonderful quality of being pointed is what these are doing. It's not so much that they're supporting weight, is that they're getting high so you can start the curve high enough to get the catenary curve of the bridge to hold the railway. So they're pushing it up. And the, the a cable rides through them, as you know. It can move in them. And it's better than great embutments on both sides. So the whole point of these are to lift. And they do lift. And they lift wonderfully as, as towers themselves. And that way, of course, they're looking toward, toward Brooklyn. But, but looking back toward the, toward the island, on that island, the, the towers are going to grow. But these still remain this great, really marvelous entry to New York. Now, it comes in, should have shown you here, Brooklyn Bridge comes in right here. It's right at the tip of this new Amsterdam, right here. And it comes in right behind City Hall, which uh, we see over here. It comes in, City Hall is right there in the lower left of the picture. The bridge is coming in right over here. And the first skyscraper is almost built as if to greet the bridge here, even to outdo the bridge. And it's a newspaper building. It's not a warehouse like the Marshall Field Warehouse, say. Warehouse which wants to have as much space as possible, but is otherwise quiet. It's not rhetorical. It's not gesturing. But from the very beginning, the newspaper wants to dominate the city, dominate City Hall, influence it, if it can. It's the Tribune building by Richard Morris Hunt of 1873 uh, to 1877, and it wants to be just as tall as possible, and it has a spire. And everything about it is just twisted up. The roof here, second empire roof, is just twisted up in the type here to get the height. And indeed, in, in 1880 already, it, it's added on to in height by an architect named Rott here. So everything about it is to be high, and to be a spire, and to be seen from the sea, and to dominate City Hall. Then it's joined by another newspaper, uh, the World uh, Paper, which becomes Pulitzer by George B. Post. And here's that wonderful old early 19th century City Hall by the French architect Mongin, right down here, very classical. And here's the newspaper power 
the new power of the mass press, which is rising here. And the whole thing is like one spire itself. It's got a curved corner. It's like sort of like this. You can feel it. It's like a creature. It goes way, way up, top heavy almost, like a zoomy shallico bird that teeters on its legs. And it goes way up. And you imagine, I'm sure that's the boardroom up there. And they're looking down on City Hall. They got higher dome as possible. Everything about it is rhetorical. The whole building is one spire. And they're right there in the heart of the city. They're right there where they can change the policy of the city, where they can influence the mayor and the alderman and so on. At the same time, each one wants to be the tallest building in, the t in town so it can be seen from the sea. Now, they're, they're both bearing wall buildings. And then a bunch of uh, uh, Chicago skyscraper construction buildings are built. The first really big one, though, is the Flatiron Building of 1902. And it's by a Chicago architect. Uh, and it's our famous Daniel Burnham here, the architect whom Wright said had sold out to the Bazaar and so on. And the Flatiron Building is a good example of the irregular plan down there, because this is exactly where Broadway is coming in to Fifth Avenue. And it's at 23rd Street. And apparently, there was a phrase, which I'm sure you've never heard, because it's older than you, older than me, called 23 skidoo. Silly, but anyway. And it's supposed to mean, get going, let's go, 23 skidoo. It's supposed to have occurred because the policemen here, the winds were generated when this building came up. It generated terrific winds, still does, at the corner. And when women would come here, their skirts would blow up. And the loungers would hang around to watch this happen. I mean, they were very highly sexed and frustrated in those days. And they were watching it here. And the policemen trying to protect the women would say, go up 23rd Street. 23rd Street, you get out of the wind. 23 skidoo anyway. So. But the point is, you see, the point is, it, it's like Sullivan's guarantee building in being a steel frame. Sullivan's building of 1896. But again, Sullivan, though it's in Chicago, is on the grid. So you've got the rectangular volume, and he wants a regularity of stress. But he's got really a, a, a slab. And then it's, it's a slab that also turns into almost barely two dimensions. Uh, well, and, and because, of course, it's a compressed slab rather than a burgeoning basket, you know, and say the grid, he, he clouds it more heavily, more solidly. He's really interested in that shaft as, a, as the expression of a slab. And indeed, as I say, it gets to be almost two-dimensional. It's magical when you get down here, 23 skidoo, and the whole thing leans up. It's really one of the great buildings in New York. I don't know if any of you have ever been in it, but they have offices there, and it's a small building, as you can see. And there are several publishers' offices here. And here are the publishers right up in front. And he's the king of New York from there. You look up Fifth Avenue, there's the Hudson, there's the East River. You're in charge. It's running right up the aisle. Really quite, it's like being the captain of a ship. And then the, you're, it's, the floors are small enough so your company can take over the whole floor. Martin Press takes up both two floors up through there. It's absolutely a fantastic building to be in. It's one of the, it seems to me one of the really great experiences in New York is to get up there and get in one of those offices. And in any event, it is, though, unusual. I mean, after all, it is a slab on that particular site. The more common thing is the type, almost like the old church type, which is uh, a lower building and then a tall tower. Tower just as hard, high as you can get. And this is Madison Square Garden. Sure, when this is Fifth Avenue, Madison Square is about 30th Street, and it's farther uh, east on the other side. And as you know, it's by McKinley and White in 1891. And the sad thing that happened there in 1906 was uh, Stanford White, great man about town, was shot by a crazy millionaire here who got off, as a matter of fact, by blackening White's character uh, at the trial. But the spire is one that's very familiar to him. Over and over again, it's the Herald of Sevilla. Time and time again, it's the Biltmore, it's the Freedom Tower downtown, it's the one that used to be in on uh, Miami Beach. It's the Herald of Sevilla, adapted each one slightly, but it, which expressed somehow to Americans of the late 19th and the early 20th century all the best that a spire could be, all the best that a tower could be. And this one was especially popular because way up there in the top, almost invisible, so that the young bucks used to watch it through spyglasses, 
was a statue of Diana uh, by uh, St. Gaudens, Augustus St. Gaudens. And uh, it's, it's chaste enough and virginal enough, but it was uh, without any clothing, so they would gather down below and watch it way up there in space. So the, the, it lifts that image high, high into the air. Now, very soon, this is built in 1891, if you look downtown from it, not so far down there, you get other spires. And most of them that we see here are churches, but you see how it's the spire that you see. But by, say, 1908, it was being built, joined by skyscrapers that were built just on this principle of a lower volume of building and then a high tower that goes around it. And the most interesting of those, I think, oh, sorry, is the, uh, is the New York Life Insurance Building by LeBrun and, and, and sons and brothers. It's a New York family of architects. You never hear of them except as New York builders. That door, something's got to be done about that damnable door. It just keeps doing it in the breeze. Let's see if we can do anything about it. Oh, good. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Dave. And you can see that here's a building that first has a lower building, and it's Richardsonian. We're used to that. Then it adds this. It adds the spire. And the first thing you see about it is that, that you say to yourself, how could they possibly afford it? I mean, there could be hardly any rentable space in there. This makes sense. That obviously is a volume. You can rent most of it, like in Chicago. But this is obviously built for glory. That's all. You've got the elevator in there. There's very little room around it. It's true that they didn't have much confidence in the light with their artificial lighting wasn't as good as it is today, so they had to be closer to the windows. But nevertheless, there's almost no room. And this becomes characteristic of the New York skyscrapers. So many of them are built purely for glory, to be seen. They're iconological elements, iconographic. They're, 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 they're to, they, they have a meaning to express from a distance. And what this wants to be is what it was for a while, the tallest building in New York. Now it has a model, which is, and you see it's really almost a church type. There's uh, Trinity Church at the end of Wall Street that I showed you about. You see you have the nave, which is lower, and then the spire. Almost that same kind of thing is developing here. The lower thing, almost like a kind of nave, but all the way, power, everything they want goes here uh, into the spire. Now its model is the great Campanile in Venice. As you can see, it's very close to that. Based on, it's one of the few that's not based on the Herald of Sevilla. The other thing that's interesting is that, that this, the New York Life Insurance Building, is an older building than the Campanile of Venice, which was built in the, about the 14th and 15th century. And the reason is that before this was designed, the Campanile had collapsed. The Campanile, the whole thing, imagine that, collapsed completely at the beginning of the 20th century. And it wasn't rebuilt completely until about 1913 or so, just before World War II, it was World War I, it was rebuilt. So in fact, this is an older building. They put it up while that building was lying in a great mound of ruin there, curious. So they were reviving it in a sense. They, there was no way to know that it ever would come back completely the way it had been before. And it's kind of appropriate too, because in Venice, the tower there, the Campanile rises so high that if you're up there, you can see across the Grand Lagoon out there, you can see to the Lido, and you can really see all the way to the Adriatic. You see way out to sea. And this has the same quality. It wants to be seen from the narrows. It wants to be seen as the, as the ships are coming uh, up the river. If they come up the Hudson, you look across New York, and this building is the tallest building. They say, what's that? And they say, that's the New York life insurance. You must buy some life insurance when you become an American, and so on. And there it is up high up in space. And Rem Koolhaas did a, a very touching uh, drawing of it, showing it as a lighthouse, showing it basically to have the same quality as a lighthouse to be seen by ships at sea. Now, when this was completed in 1909, it joined a building that was just finished. It was earlier, finished a few months before. And this is another one like that, which also Rem Koolhaas saw in the same way. And it had the same, it was the same type. It was the lower uh, volume and then the high spire that rises. And this was the Singer building. 
by Ernest Flagg. And the singer, of course, is the, what is the uh, uh, sewing machine people. And uh, the sewing machine was enormously important still in the economy of a household when I was young. And in the early 20th century, it was one of the major exports of the United States. And they used to say, we'll have one in every grass hut in the world, we'll have a Singer sewing machine. Wonderful old iron thing with which the, uh, the, the, your, your mother would tread up and down. Uh, and it was a fundamental in a time when people did mend clothes and make clothes much more than they do now. So it was a very, it was a very important business in this building even though it's really a year earlier than the, uh, like, it's really more integrated after all. They, they really in, clearly, de, from the very beginning, intend to have it all one composition. So here you really do get, as it were, the nave and then the high spire. And it's a different style, you might say, than the other. The other you call it sort of Venetian medieval, or Venetian Gothic, perhaps. This one is sort of Beaux-Arts Baroque of the late 19th century kind of thing they built for the great exhibitions and so on. But the type, that's the point, is the same. The type is exactly the same. And the differences of de detail don't make much difference at all. And they used to describe how when the ships would go out with the salesmen to sell these all over the world, the executives out there would signal to them. They signal back and forth to each other. It's kind of the romance of commerce. And you can see it here as it looked. Uh, uh, probably about 1920 or you know, a little later, uh, on the skyline there. Still the tallest at that time, the tallest building in New York. Now, while these spires were the tallest, many of the other buildings also, basically shapeless slabs, but nevertheless were getting high too. So all of downtown New York was turning into that canyon, or those canyons that New Yorkers became so proud of. And I show you Trinity Ch uh, Wall Street again with Trinity Church. And where Trinity Church before dominated everything, now these other buildings are just about almost as tall as it is and much bigger. You see a lot of them are still very Richardsonian as you see it here. And there's Washington here in front of the old treasury and so on, the customs house. But you see they're rising into these treasure, these canyons which cut off the light and made the streets dynamic and crowded and which were New York's pride, which they took a very romantic excitement in. And you can see that in a famous set of guidebooks to New York. There's a man named King and he had a series of guidebooks for many years. So this is King's of 1908. This is King's dream of New York in 1908. And you can see what it's turning into. Down there, way down there, somewhere, is the Singer building. Here it is. Now it's all engulfed in the rest of the city. The rest of the city is rising high around it. As it does so, the street level becomes multi-level. You get the streets going down below a sidewalk level, and you have bridges going across them at this level. You have various kinds of transportation moving across. This, they come up here, and they're all different heights. They rise up, and at the top, they turn into fantasy. They have all these wonderful fantasies at the top. And then on top of that, they have that great, that image that the early, 19th century, early 20th century was so excited about, the uh, lighter than air machine. Everybody thought that these were going to be more important than the, than the airplane. They're going to be great, of these great dirigibles floating wonderfully all across the world. And here, they're like tough little, fast moving little lighter than air machines up. So the whole thing is a great fantasy when you get up above. Now, it immediately, it reminds you of a couple of things. This is where the scale of the urbanism brought on by the skyscraper begins to change. With Sullivan in Chicago, or in St. Louis, as we see it on the right, it was still basically Italian Palazzo block. A little taller, but not much. And the same uh, thing arises, and everything was more or less at the same height. Now all that's gone has gotten very, very high. Very, very high. And so the street is changing, too their view of the street. It's not just a simple, stable element here. It may also go down as these are going up. And the thing is, as you get up there, how do you get the light into the street? How do you make the whole thing work? Now, Sullivan gave thought to that. And in the very year that he finished the Wainwright building, 1891, 
he published an article in which he made some proposals. What you do when they're going to get taller? He, he foresees the New York situation. He says, well, he says, you, you keep the Wainwright building down like this, keep street level, keep scale, then you cut it back so light can come into the street like this, rather wonderful way, slashes of light like this, and you raise it up. Then when you get up here, and he has his tongue in his cheek, but he, he, he really, he, he's kidding everybody, and he's saying this is what other architects will do, but he's saying you can have fantasy. And why not? When you get up there, you can have fantasy. It's interesting, that was Coolhouse's conclusion, if you can call it that, in Delirious New York. Didn't remember the school. Basically, the type is a base and then a fantastic thing. It can be anything you like up on top. Now, it's interesting, too. You can see it right here in Coral Gables. I mean, a, a poor Merrick never got a chance to build the business district as he might have liked to, so we don't know what that would have been. Then there came the modern period with really deeply grotesque buildings down there. You know, what some of them are hard to describe them. They're so incredible that anybody would want to do them. But mostly, all of them, when they got up high, got very dull because the tops were flattened right off. Now, that was supposed to be moral and all that with modern architecture, but it makes a very dull skyline. And if you go down there now, all that Mediterranean stuff that's going on now is really marvelous if you just look at it with open eyes up against the sky. There's all this fantasy. There's the, there's the uh, uh, you know, the spires of this and that rise against the sky. It's much more interesting. It really is. If you have no prejudice against play and fun and delight, it makes a wonderful sky outline. And, and Sullivan's saying, you can do that. You can do that here. Now, however seriously he took these proposals, others took them very, very seriously, as we'll see later. Very seriously indeed. And they play a part when they start thinking of how we're going to build the setback skyscrapers to let light into the street. Now, the other people who were taken by this vision were all Europeans. This becomes the great vision of Metropolis, all the movies that come out of this later. This is the new world. This is America. There's no place like this. What a fantasy. But most of all, the ones who took it most touchingly to heart were those middle-class idealists who were the first artists of the Russian Revolution in 1917, the people we loosely call constructivists. You could call them a lot of other things, suprematists. They have all kinds of different names. We'll talk about that later. But here's a proposal of theirs in 1919 right after the revolution. And see, there's the old world down here. And now it's these uh, lighter-than-air machines rising up, carrying these great banners, <laughs> carrying these great banners up into the sky. And the whole world has become this world of dynamism and advertising and, and uh, uh, words up in the air and so on. The, the, the way this whole page of King already imagines. And they see America as the basis of that. Now the other, when they got a chance to build it, which is very rare, because they didn't have any money, they didn't have the resources, but there is one group in Kharkov, which is this uh, rather depressing name, it's the center of heavy industry of 1926. But you see, they really are trying to build this. Down at this edge, these buildings are mega structures which cross the street, multi-level, they have their bridges, basically detailed, more or less, like these office buildings. And it is the American model as much as they can get to it. Now, Stalin comes along later. He doesn't like this. But what he does is also based on the American skyscraper, uh, as we'll see. Now, another building that could have affected those very much is what is the next important skyscraper, which is the municipal building, which is right behind City Hall here and part of City Hall, uh, and it's by McKinney and White. And it's from 1910, 1911. And I say it's like those, because like those, it's a mega structure. There's a street goes through there, like this. There's a wonderful uh, subway station right in here, which has great Catalan Guastavino vaults in there. Some of the most beautiful ones in New York that you can see anywhere. And the bridge is over beyond it over here. And here's City Hall, and this rises up, and now it's like that, it does in a way. It's got its spot, towers going up top, but it's pulling the slab way up with it, way up with it like this, and stretching out now. So it's really taking over blocks, you see, in that megastructural way. 
And as I say, the street goes through it. And every way you feel, as in those images, those constructivist images, that the building, the one building, is taking over the whole city. Now, right across from it, diagonally, with the East River behind it, is really probably the great masterpiece of this whole early phase, and that's the Woolworth Building, with the Hudson behind it, as you can see. Now, the Woolworth Building, obviously, is the climax of the type of the uh, aisles of the, of, of, of the uh, main body of the church and of the spire. And where Trinity Church is, you see it all of it lists like this. They picked that up here, and where Trinity Church is now dwarfed by the buildings around it, it's as if it's picked up and becomes those buildings and becomes taller than they. It's a real climax, and it's the real victory of, that, uh, of the type. That's by Cass Gilbert, as you know. Cass Gilbert, remember, here it is, 1913. In 1908, he built the New Haven Public Library, which is a little Georgian building to get along with the, with the churches on the green. So he's a contextual architect. Uh, it really, the style for the job, as Sarah was to say later. Here he's got a totally different program. And you might say, they, they used to be dismissed as Gothic detail, but just as much as Louis Sullivan, maybe more, he handles, Louis Sullivan hand, handled Celtic interlaces, he handles basically more or less Gothic detailing to make it look like metal. It really does. It looks metallic, elegant. It's like a wonderful casket of metal, very delicate, full of life, and also extremely expressive of the structure. That's where the big columns are here and the infilling, mullions in between. And when you get here, it's bigger and it rises at the corner. In terms of the rational expression of structure, really it's more than Sullivan, who simply conceals the structure behind the others. And this is wonderful lift. And if any of you have seen the pictures, the very touching pictures of the towers going down, the towers burning, they took all through the day, the camera moves around and then out of the smoke will come this building, sailing. The others are going down, but this one comes sailing out like this. The way it does come forward into that space. And if the first one, the Tribune, you know, was admonishing City Hall with its tower, this one really is kind of outdoing it, lifting above the whole thing. Nevertheless, it's a wonderful group. Oh yes, and this is somebody up there, up there high up. And you see it's a filigree, a beautiful filigree. And all of it dynamic and upward lifting. That detail expresses it, I think, pretty well as it lifts up there to the spire. Now, it is a wonderful group. I think you look diagonally, it, you're looking more or less from it. You look across it, and there's the municipal building. And there's the Tribune, in its taller face. And here's the world, still there. And uh, it's, it's a group of, that makes a, a, a very special kind of city. And right around, I think it's no accident, right around City Hall, dominating it here. Now, this is what Joseph Stalin loved. And he didn't like the constructivists. He was, these were, after all, intellectuals. The people didn't like them very much. The people didn't understand them. And he wanted to build skyscrapers. And in the 30s, he wasn't able to do it because he was killing everybody and having his purges and the five-year plans. Then there was the terrible war. But as soon as the war was over, in 1945, he began to try to impose his skyscrapers on Russia and indeed on all of Eastern Europe. And a lot of the uh, buildings that you find in Warsaw and as you know in many other places in Eastern Europe in the Stalinist period after 1945 are of this type. And they're like a condensation, to use that word again, between the municipal building and the Woolworth building. They rise, they're more or less gothic -y in detail, they rise to the center, they rise to the spire, and he used to love to put a red star up there on the very type. And this becomes the type of Stalinist realism, made of very elegant materials, beautifully constructed, uh, very rich in detail, expressing, as it were, in this very poor country on its uppers all the time, in this one building, this one type, trying to express the whole aspiration, the whole image, the whole, the whole myth of what in, indeed he'd like to create. And indeed, he, he tried to impose them on Leningrad, on the Leningrad Soviet. And they, they repelled him, they fought, they fought him. And it brought on some of his last purges after World War II. 
in Leningrad, where again they he, they earned his eternal enmity because they opposed his skyscrapers. But he was able, like this one, to build them in Moscow. And in Moscow, they had a peculiarly intelligent urbanistic effect, which is this. Moscow, you know, you see it here. And here's the river, Moskva. And the university is way out here, south of the river, like this. And right in the center here is the Kremlin, which is surrounded by walls here. And then there's the basic plan is a bunch of circumvallazioni that go on like this, ever expanding out from the Kremlin in the center. Series, you might say, of, of, of walls or places for buildings. And then things go out to them from the center, radiating, pretty much like that. Now, it, in the Kremlin itself, at the very heart of it, you have a, a fantasy. You have a fantasy which is basically Italian in concept. And these spires were built by Italian architects during the Renaissance. And the type really goes back to Filaretti's dreams of an ideal city, like called Sforzinda for Milan uh, in, the, uh, in the early 15th century. As you know, and here they are, the spires. And then they're joined by the towers, the spires of St. Basil's out here, most elaborate, even kind of Baroque of all the Russian churches. So you have a, already, you have in the center, that central circumvallazione, and you have the spires pointing. I once was walking down here with Louis Kahn, and I looked up at the tower and I said, see how it points. And he said, yes, and see how it brings the weight down. And you can see, and it does, of course, both things. Semiologically, it points. You look at it the other way, compressively, you feel the weight coming down. In any event, then you see, you go out, and, and one of those circular roads, where the other road comes in, you have a square, and you mark it with a big building. And you go out further and you have another one, like this. And then they begin to call to each other across space. And you can't rebuild the rest of the town, most of which is it's about a two-story town, most of it, a lot of it in wood. That time doesn't have the money to do it. He does it this way with these big symbolic images that are decked out across the whole town and change the whole feeling of the place. Now, of course, modern planners thought it was terrible, but Aldo Rossi thought it was wonderful, and he thought it was a real triumph of urbanism. And it's a good example that, that good architecture and good urbanism is not necessarily done by good people. It's not that simple. You can't just say, here's a good guy, he's going to do good architecture. Yeah, uh, uh, Stalin, after all, is one of the great monsters of history, without any question. Uh, but uh, here the image was pretty wonderful, it seems. And you get, people would complain, for example, about the use, but again, it's a type, and you conform to the type, because the type is more important to you than uh, idle change. So, for example, you get office buildings like this, or you get hotels, like the famous Ukraina here, for example, famous foreigners hotel, and you get way up there in a room, and in all likelihood the elevator wouldn't work, you say, oh, what a lousy place. They don't know what they're doing. Uh, you, uh, uh, it's silly. It should have all been on the flat, but it's worth it to them. And it is, I think, worth it. And then most of all, most wonderfully, even today, when you see it from the river, from the center of town, the great vision of the university, which fills the horizon like this, all the spires pointing up here in space. So that's a curious development and very different from what happened in America, but certainly growing right out of that first phase, that spired phase of, uh, of, the, of the New York skyscraper. Now, while that was going on, those skyscrapers, that is back there long before this went on, back there in, in 1914 and 15 and so on, these skyscrapers were developing into little colonies right there on the tip of the, ri of the, of the river. And it wasn't all pl plotted out in great distance, but very close together, quite small, comparatively, compared to the Stalinist ones. But really, they turn out, they're kind of lovable. You can kind of associate with them. Look at the Woolworth building. You look at this way, with a little building that comes trotting in alongside it. A few years later, you can say, ah, Don Quixote and Sancho Panza. I mean, there they are. I mean, they do, they're alive. And they, finally, they all come. Right? There's the Singer building, doing its bit. Out, down, look, he's taller. I'm taller. Finally, it's all, the whole thing builds up, as I'll show you later into a kind of pyramidal composition, 
which is a, a dominated here by the bank of the Manhattan Company, which is rather late. It's 1930. And it's by Severance and Matsui. Matsui is one of the first of the distinguished Japanese architects who built New York skyscrapers like the World Trade Center by Yamasaki later. It's the center here of the whole group, but it's only down at the island. And we're seeing almost all of them, or many of them, right at this time, right at this point. The rest of the island, are those wonderful, long, flat, fast um, um, avenues rushing to the north up here. And into them, of course, from the bridges and the uh, tunnels and so on, are coming more and more people to work in these buildings, which are taking more and more people down here. So another development of, of this period, the first decade of the 20th century, which is complements the height of the skyscrapers, are the, are the great railroad stations, the two great railroad stations, two of the greatest railroad stations probably ever built in the world, right between 1900 and 1910. One is Penn Station by McKimmey and White, and the other is Grand Central by Warren and Wetmore. Okay. Now, uh, Penn is over there, as you know, on 7th Avenue. I guess about, I forget what street, about 32nd, maybe something like that. And it's very long and low. And, and, it, and it has monumental columns that open out on the street, and everything about it is horizontal, like this. And you can see how it's only a very little bit of New York that uses that, that sky, that uses the height, that uses that landscape. And that, of course, is why Penn Station can be torn down later in 1963. The greed for that airspace for a new Madison Square Garden was just greater than at that time the capacity of the architectural or the preservation or the public as a whole, communities, to stop it. And it's one of the great, it's one of the great uh, shames, really, of all of us. I remember when it came up, I wasn't interested. I didn't care. Only Philip Johnson, curiously, among architects, and John Lindsay, among politicians. At that time, a congressman, later, importantly for this story, the, the mayor of New York, only they picketed out there in front. Johnson knew better. Johnson, right at that time, was being strongly influenced by Rome, by the way, 1963. He never was able to do anything like this, as grand as this, but he knew what those vaults meant how wonderful the whole thing was. And of course, it is a wonderful plan. Recently, that obsessed critic who used to be on the Times named Mouchon, still writes for them, who really has a sort of childish sense of modern architecture. He, says, he doesn't know quite what it is, but it's just all wonderful. It's all transparent. It's all that. And he knows this is a good building. He refers to it. But he has to say, it's really you know, silly bazaar. What that means, I don't know. It means nothing. But nevertheless, of course, it's not. It's really a very, very great building. It has a great plan. I talked about it before, but I want to talk about it again. Take it this time from the street, before we came up this way. The street, you see, you go in here, you see the way in. It takes the whole, it's a, mega, it's a mega building, too, after all. It takes the whole block like that. You come in the arcade, it goes down, and this goes up, so you come in this vast space, which, rises, which is lighted by those three thermal windows right there. Then it goes through here, where the vaults are not cladded, but where all the, the steel work is apparent, and you go down here to the trains, or you come the other way, as we saw before. And when you go down that avenue, you see the way it works. Beautifully made, everything, and shops on both, both sides. And you look toward that space, which you can see is a little mysterious. You know it goes up, you know it goes down, but you're not quite sure how much. Then when you get there, it opens, you see it expands. You have this enormous space, more than 100 feet high rising above you. Then, of course, when you go beyond it, you're out in this world, the train and the engine and the iron and the steel, and, thing, and it goes down to the trains and a forest of steel. Then, of course, it's even more interesting, better, really, coming the other way. So all the people who went during the war, usually in training camps in the south, come back, get a 72-hour pass, rushing out. This is the first thing you saw. You came up from this, you came out there. God, look at that, what a glory. And it was a glory, too, because this, this picture gives a better idea of what that hall is like. It's the Baths of Caracalla. And even though the vaults have fallen, you can tell because you're down at the ground level and there are people in it how awesome that space was. And you can see, for the Greeks, body was holy. The body was holy. The temple is a body. It's holy. For the Romans, the space was holy. Templum for Romans meant a sacred space, not a building. You can see it's holy. 
and this one, same. And of course, this one has, but this is lost, but you see where they are? Huh. The, the columns are used not to hold it up, because it's all concrete back here, but to look as if it's being blown up, to hold it down, and the impulse box stretch, and you get that dome of heaven. You get the wind-blown canopy that I talked about before, and which the Romans wanted in their vaults. The vault is really heavy. Roman vault is heavy, but it looks like air lifting, a membrane. And of course, one reason the architects wouldn't take part in trying to save it, what they say, well, it's fake, you know, there's really steel behind there, but it's no more fake than the Roman. The Roman made heavy look light. This just covered steel with, uh, with plaster. But whatever the case, it was gone, and you all know it, and there's no need it. You know, this is the height now. Imagine that. Anyway. And it's really, it's really the complement of the skyscraper. This is where the great masses came in who were going to work down there. And then the same is true of Grand Central. Now, Grand Central never got destroyed by modernism, but it did get Pan, the Pan Am building destroying it this way in mass out here. Cutting off Hermes here with the tower back there, which is the space it was in the town. Nevertheless, um, they wanted more. Breyer testified that uh, they had plenty of these in Europe. It wasn't very good. He had a proposal here, which is the most infantile I ever saw. It had three great big struts. Struts, that's all, coming out like this. Four of them, like this, holding up his building above it. And here you have this compact body that really had a, had a body to it. And of course, its space is running across like that. And it's probably not quite as distinguished. It never seemed to me so, though it's very beautifully made as Penn Station. But it's a beautiful volume of space. You're coming in from one of the side streets there. And those thermal windows are hidden from us here. They're lighting in on both sides of it, left and right. I'm oh, sorry. They're lighting in on both sides of the inner space. It gives you some idea of it, like this. And fortunately, now it's all been restored, as you know. It's very beautiful. But what's really wonderful is that whole urbanistic relationship where it, 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 it's crossing the traffic. The traffic is rising and going around it. On both sides, coming down and going up. Like this. And it's uh, lower Fifth Avenue. Fifth Avenue South is coming up to it like that. And you see there's 42nd Street underneath. And the road is going around elevated like this. And it carries on to Park Avenue. Park Avenue South, excuse me. It goes on to Park Avenue beyond it. And the tower there marks where Park Avenue begins way down there. So the space is opening like this. That's, again, the space that, that was filled by the Pan Am. And Hermes comes forward here. The messenger comes forward in space. The eye goes past it like that. And from the other side, before Pan Am destroyed it, it was, as I already pointed out, a wonderful marker. So when you get back up here on Park Avenue at the military crest, you look down that wonderful avenue. And by extension, you went all the way down to the skyscrapers down there at the end. You found down the aisle. And that, of course, is, is the great urban balance of New York at that period, that moment. And it was caught in New York, lithographers and so on loved it. This is my, uh, um, uh, it's a print of about 1930 by a man named Cook, typical of the New York school at that time. They say the typical methods of the composition and so on, but thick smoke in the heavy air and then the bank of the Manhattan Company and the Singer Building and rising up here in this great pyramid, but also other buildings that look very mountainous and which really come from something else. They don't develop until the 1920s. And they begin to develop back there in Chicago, which is where we really have to go now if we want to talk some more about New York. And it goes like this. Uh, in 1922, the Tribune newspaper, again a newspaper, okay? Tribune newspaper, which is owned by Colonel McCormick, was kind of successor of William Randolph Hearst, and a very reactionary man, but very openly patriotic, and, and in the center of Chicago, enormous power, political power in town, uh, 
uh, initiates a, a competition to build a new office building. And he honestly wants it to be what he says. He wants it to be the most beautiful building in the world, and he wants it to mean something. Uh, and he had a competition, which I'll talk about in a minute, and it was won by Raymond Hood, who was a young architect from New York, and he was in a uh, partnership with an older architect named Howells. So it was Hood and Howells win the competition. And Hood's building, you see it over there on the right, it reminds you a little bit of the Woolworths. In a sense, it's kind of gothic-y detailed for vertical continuity, and it's got a lower area, see, as part of it. But it loses that wonderful taut relation of body. This building is like a centaur with the body rising, the head and neck rising from the body. Here, the whole thing is blown up in scale. The other part becomes inconsequential, and it goes up, instead of to a spire, it goes up to a chapter house where Colonel McCormick's office is up there, and with these big sort of buttresses on both sides. It's kind of heavy handed, but it's a big, strong continuity, and it's clearly very much a New York building, New York type, rather than the old Chicago Loop type. And then the place it is, is, is what I think is really wonderful. Here it is over here, just rising. And it's right where the river comes down and starts to empty into Lake Michigan. And here is the loop. And you can see it. Look at it. It's perfect. Here are the blocks, the low blocks. Perfect. But here's New York, you see, beginning to rise up here and also rising up in response to this New York building. And it's opening out here at this wonderful point where Michigan Boulevard, which we saw down there, with Sullivan and so on down here, now it's coming up to the north above the river. Right there with the river, you get a special spot, very different from the loop. It's an exciting spot. And here these, these wonderful towers rise. Oh, sorry. And you can see the way they do gives way from the Tribune there toward the river. And then the river runs underneath and the towers rise around it. It's a wonderful point. In 1988, Tigerman and, and uh, Tom Beebe and others, Chicago architects and others, put on a show of Chicago architecture. And the way they set up the exhibition was really wonderful. When they came to this part, they brought you into a room that was darkened. The floor was all deep blue glass, it seemed that way down below you. The light came deep blue up underneath. And it was just like this. It gave you this feeling, this is a magical spot. And they catch us, and they never could have caught it with that Chicago blocky type. They're all responding to each other, you see, the spires. And you see what happens. When modernism struck, here's a building, the last one built there by uh, Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. When this, when this strikes, all of a sudden, it isn't conversing anymore. Here it's absolutely dumb. You can see that cut off top. It's not gesturing, it's not sparring, it's not aspiring. It's a block, it's really static. You can see it there, it looks so uncivilized in that relationship. So at least so it seems to me. Certainly, you can make groups of buildings like that that aren't, but nevertheless, here in this setting, it's so badly contextual. But we'll come back to those problems later. The other thing, though, that may be even more interesting than all this is the fact that of the competition itself. And the Chicago Colonel McCormick was very honest about the competition. He wanted open, he wanted worldwide, he wanted the best building, no fear or favor chosen. Uh, and he later published them all, except one or two, which is interesting. We'll talk about those, those couple that weren't published later. But he tried to publish all the entries, even the one by the cartoonist for the Tribune, down the left, whose, whose character apparently looked like that and who made a building out of him there. Now, the entries in the competition are really fantastic. The ones from Europe, in many ways, were hard to believe. They were ar by architects, of course, who'd never seen a skyscraper. They'd heard it described, but they'd never seen one, probably. And some of them seem very amateur in drawing. You can imagine yourself when you draw so well. Here's one from Germany, where Colonel McCormick wanted the building to mean something, and it's America, which means to the German of the early 20th century, it means the novels of Ernst May, who Hitler was brought up on. May was a man who wrote hundreds of novels about redskins and fighting cowboys and Indians in America. That was Hitler's favorite reading when he was young. All Germans, he's not the one. And I suppose moved by that, he's got this red skin with a, with a thing. But look at the drawing, it's really, 
really pitiable drawing, but nevertheless, there it is, and it's, it's dutifully published. Or in this one, from sunny Italy, way down from Barry, way down on the heel of Italy, we have a gigantic triumphal arch and quadrigas and this and that, and a dome up above and so on, like this. But the one that the whole architectural avant-garde from that day to this is always preferred is this one by the Viennese architect Adolf Loos. And I always find it hard really to understand why everybody has liked it so much. It seems kind of silly to me. But nevertheless, you can see why it's a great swelling Doric column rising on a blocky base down here. And uh, you might say, well, it is the archetype of the skyscraper. It's what Sullivan said, it's the base, the shaft, and the capital. But it seems to me it, it, a little ridiculous. It doesn't look anything at all like Lose's other work. It's hard to believe he did it in a way. But it is interesting because Lose, in 1905, had written a little book called Ornament und Verbrechen, Ornament and Crime, and in which he really says that ornament is a crime, and he ascribes what he calls sexual perversion to those who publish ornament. And I suppose as a symbol of his contempt for sexual perversion, he gives you this great male uh, vision against the sky. I suppose that's why they like it. It is interesting, in 1988, when they had a show of Chicago architecture, they also had attached to it what they called late entries in the Chicago Tribune competition. Now, Saren's entry, which I'll show you later, was late, along with another one from Finland. So they're, they're, they're alluding to that. But these are very late. They're 1988. And almost all of them go for this. Almost all of them have some comment to make on Los. This is Stern, Robert Stern where it turns the whole thing to glass. And I think rather crude in profile and, and clumsy in effect, but nevertheless, it's based on this. Or Tom Beebe cloaks it in the American flag, for example, here. But I thought the most appropriate response was from a, a, a woman architect from Argentina named Susana Torre, who quite simply castrated it. Yeah, like boom, like that. And making it much smaller, she puts it way, way down over there. So anyway, <laughs> it seemed the most appropriate. Interview. It's interesting how many French, how many French entries clothed it. They drew this, they drew the, the los, and they clothed it in what the French so delicate, delicately call a preservatif. Anyway, but Susanna Torrey wasn't having any of that, and she did this. Now, one of the most interesting ones, I think, entries was by Walter Gropius and his right-hand man, at the Bauhaus, by that time, named Hannes Meyer. And I always thought it was one of Gropius's best projects, one of his best buildings. Better, I think, than anything he ever did in America. You can see what he did. He, he, uh, he knew the Chicago window perfectly. And he gave you the proportion of Chicago Bay, the traditional Chicago Bay. But then he made it dynamic, or tried to make it dynamic, with a, what are basically First of all, Dutch to style, but much more Russian constructivist detailing to make it look as if it's moving down Michigan Boulevard toward the south. You see, it would be coming this way toward the river, like that. And it, 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 it seems to be pretty, uh, pretty interesting. And you, you can find a lot of decon uh, skyscrapers designed pretty much like that today. Maybe a little different, but basically the same kind of thing. Take the frame and then do things give it, as it were, a sense of dynamism, action, discontinuity, and so on. Uh, and the, the poor Russians thought so. The Russians saw their own constructivism in it, because a few years later, in 1925-26, for Izvestia, for the other uh, state newspaper, along with Pravda, this was the building that was proposed. And you see, it's that building with its basic shapes and frames and its basic detailing made much smaller because the Russians didn't have the money and it wasn't that big a program. Tiny little building. And unfortunately, it was never built. I say unfortunately because Colonel McCormick made his reputation mostly as a red baiter as time went on. And I've always thought it would have been very amusing if he and his Vestia had the same building, had the same type of building, despite all the rhetoric. But nevertheless, uh, the Gropius building is, is clearly very interesting, but it's not at all like what the American architects were doing, nothing. The, 
probably the best American entry, at least the one that the jurors thought so, uh, uh, was by a, a really very good architect I'll talk about later, named Bertram Goodhue. And Bertram Goodhue was what I suppose Mouchon would call a Beaux-Arts architect, a very, very good architect. And his building, you see, doesn't express the frame at all. You'd never know that there was a skeleton frame behind that. It looks as if it was modeled out of heavy clay, out of plasticine. And indeed, sometimes the, the models for these buildings were made that way. It looks like a solid mountain, which is cut back in steps, irregularly, but basically farther and farther back until it rises there at a spire. Now, that is one of the early American responses by American architects. And a lot of the other buildings by Americans were a good deal like this, though not as good. Uh, it really is a response to the New York zoning laws of 1916. Remember, they said, uh, the streets now are not getting enough light. We want to work out a system where if a street is a certain width, you can go up a certain distance before you set back, but you have to set back at a certain angle of light. And if the street is wider and the buildings are lower, and they step back like this. And you, so immediately the architects set out to work out how they could work out a building on this principle, as if it were solid, which was cut into steps, cut into step backs. And uh, on the other hand, remember that Sullivan, Sullivan had had a different view. He hadn't seen him stepping back from the street. His, his view may have been better. He saw the street as being kept at a basic scale of like a traditional scale, and then the light slicing it at the side, which is really pretty nice. And as a matter of fact, the very first building built in New York in 1919, in response to the setback laws, is certainly based on that building right there. Look at it. See, there's the base. There's this thing going up. There's a spire, there's the same Lucarne up there at the top. And that's by Whitney Warren. That's by the architect of uh, Grand Central Station, Warren and Whitmore. So that, but the other people don't do it. That's, that's the only example where, where you find, it, as it were, Sullivan's suggestion is taken by somebody who obviously had read Sullivan's architect article and tried to do it that way. Instead, what you got was really, you know, and, and Sullivan, Sullivan showed what he would have done in that same situation. He got in a corner building, which is exactly, you see, simply take it around the corner. Keep the level here, but up above, have it come out and finally go up to a spire. But that's not what the American architects on the whole took up. What they took up, we see even better in another building by Bertram Goodhue. And this is built before, begin, it's begun, before he goes into the Tribune competition. He wins the competition in 1920 for the state capital of Nebraska, in Lincoln, Nebraska, way out in the rolling prairies, as far from the central city as you can get. And it's, you see, a solid mass, here more of a pure tower than the setback mountain, but still a solid mass which is cut back, like this. And the building below it looks like a heavy, solid, massive, but it's all steel frame, of course. It's cut back, which you deeply cut into like this. Now, I don't know how many of you have seen it, but I find it, I saw it once about 40 years ago. And it's probably changed since then, but the, at that time, it was so perfect in its setting that it's, when you drive across Iowa, you have the great rolling, the great space, and every once in a while you see grain elevators. They're the only things that stand there. Then all of a sudden, one of those grain elevators is capped with gold, and it's the state capital. It's really perfect. It's scaled right to the road, to the prairie. Then when you get down to Lincoln, which at that time, I don't know what it's like now, at that time was very fairly low building, say about four stories at the most, five stories like this. You have the other scale, two scales. The scale and what's around it and that to the whole countryside. And it's really quite wonderful. Those, those doorways are so potent and masterful here. There's a sculptor named Lee Lowry who did a lot of this sculpture. By this time, we should be calling it Art Deco, really, but they call everything Art Deco. We'll see it in a minute what that more directly means, but it's like this. You may say that that's basically Romanesque, but it's not that. It's abstracted, but it's heavy, and it's symmetrical, and it has a more than Hittite or Assyrian mass in the sculpture which grows right out of the mass. You don't have the sculpture standing free of the mass. It grows out of the whole mountain, and it's heavy, 
powerful. Look at this. Wow. Like this. And it gives you this parti, the cross axial plan, the deep rounded entrance, and the spire behind. And that becomes exactly the parti of the Yale Art Gallery, which is also started in 1922, and which was originally by Bertram Goodhue, but then he died early one of the great tragedies, he and Leclerc both dying so young. And it was taken over by Rogers, but he kept basically the same thing. He lowered the mass a little, but it's basically the same. And my point is, you see, that's sort of Gothic, and that's sort of Romanesque, but they're the same. They're both an Art Deco, a new kind of abstraction of an enormous, heavy, solid mass, deeply hollowed out. Then behind it, you see, you have the broader and wider uh, stacks, but it's basically, basically the same. Uh, uh, organization. Now, on the other hand, the building that had the most influence on the step back skyscrapers in the 20s is one that was never built and was also in the Chicago competition. And this was an entry, this is the late entry by Elio Saren, who was a Finnish architect and you know, had already done a great, barbarously powerful railroad station in Helsinki. And he grows right out of the uh, Finnish nationalist uh, architectural movement of the late 19th century. Wonderful, powerful sense of the place, the mystery of the place, of the, of the fir forests, of the distance, of the cold, and so on, all those things. Finland is. And you can see what it does, unlike uh, the winner here, it steps back gently, and as it does, it refuses the corners and it shreds the edges as if they were pine forests. And as if it was a whole, it was a great mountain. It was a marvelously beautiful thing, I think. I mean, if it had been built, I think it would be really the icon of skyscrapers of today. The most touching thing is that Louis Sullivan, whose buildings are very different, remember, his skyscrapers. Here he's very old and he's very sick. He dies two years later. And he writes of this, he writes about it as something that's like a force of earth that's growing up out of the earth. But then the most important thing is, he says it does, is release us from the tyranny of fixed ideas. Imagine that. His own ideas, which are cut off, and classical skyscraper type that we saw. Here's, and he sees that, and he says that. And, it's, and, and, and you can see, too, that uh, I think, I've always thought it had some connection with Hartness Tower at Yale, which is by Rogers, and is published in 1920, to great eclat. People may have hated it later, but when it was published, it was seen as the hottest thing since button shoes. And you can see it's a lot like this in the sense that it's out of focus. Thing. Can you focus a little better, Jane? Ah, it's worse, worse, worse. Make it better. Go the other way. No, too far. I guess you're right. Can't get it too well. A little better. Anyway, maybe you can see it sets back. It feathers the edges, and it has colossal sculpture up there, which exactly it does too here. See, both have these these figures, these great romantic figures, high high up, which very other few other architects would do at that time, uh, of going up high up there into space. Now the interesting thing is that Raymond Hood won, and I and I think the only reason he won is because they were a little afraid of a foreign architect. They didn't say so. But here was this was much better. But he was foreign. Would he know how to do it? Could he, did he know how to build a skyscraper? After all, they didn't know a thing about building skyscrapers in Europe. Whatever the case, they, they fell upon the, the, the thing of its being a late entry. So I think everybody preferred it, even uh, Raymond Hood. Because Raymond Hood, the very year he beat him with his own design, designed the uh, American Radiator Company building in New York, and he derived it from this. Not from his own, but from this. You can see it's the same thing. It goes back, sets up, refuses the edges, builds its pine forest, goes up to its wrist and mystical top like that. It's really directly, directly out of, I've never had there been such a, such a, uh, such, such flattery of another act. When you've just beaten in a competition, and you say to yourself, his was better. That's the way I want to do it from now on. It's really remarkable. And it, this really can begin to call Art Deco. Because you see, you're getting up into this basically abstract design. Basically classical, vaguely 
uh, uh, traditional but different and rich, very rich, like it like felt like a temple rising up into the sky. The other thing about it is that it was uh, wonderfully lighted. And uh, George O'Keefe loved that and did this painting of it in 1927. It was begun, the building was begun in 1922. And all that lighting and all that exotic detailing, and that new kind of abstraction, that richness of mountain imagery, all that becomes Art Deco. Now, Art Deco, meaning Art Decoratif, you know, is a strange word like cubism. It doesn't really mean necessarily what it sounds like. It derives from the French uh, Exposition des Arts Decoratifs in Paris of 1925. I'll talk about that again, but here's a good example of one of the exhibits, one of the, one of the uh, uh, big stores that had their pavilions there. We have it's symmetrical, like classical architecture, but it loses all sense of classical character and detailing, and it's kind of a mixture of cubism and, and uh, Art Nouveau and, and what turns into jukebox quality later. Very rich, very abstract, very popular, kind of curious outgrowth of popular taste. The popular people loved it. That's part of it. In the movies that were designed in this way, this is a real popular taste of the period, which made the, the, you know, the dogmatic modernists really hate it, but it's rich and powerful, and you find it in the most important buildings, you find all those characters there. And you begin to see it in New York, very clearly, in a building like the Paramount Building of 1925-26, which is by a firm called Rap and Rap. And you see them there, where they, this part is really kind of a straightforward sort of semi-classical building. Then they send a step back, and they begin to and decorate Art Nouveau, and they go up to this big, typical Art Nouveau burst of decoration there at the top. But you notice it's also something else. It's also a stepped back pyramid, which you can see even more clearly here. And the other influence behind it, which has now come in very powerfully, and comes powerfully into New York by 1925, right when they're starting this, is from Maya architecture. It's from the architects of the Maya of the Mesoamerican civilization. And the one Maya temple that everybody looked at was the most spectacular of all. It's the high one, the tallest one at Tikal, where unlike the uh, uh, temples in Mexico to the north, they're not low and squat. There are no mountains around, so that they are the mountains themselves. They're very high, very tall. They rise up, and they have a roof comb up here with an entrance to see, which is really that, could be seen as like that as well, over there. Now, and for example, in 1925, an, arch an architect named Joseph C. Bossom published in New York this proposal for a 35-story office building, which he says will be designed according to the ancient American motifs of the Great Pyramid at Tikal, which is this uh, on the left. Or again, there's a an architect in Chile named Mujica. Uh, those who can read Spanish might be interested in reading his treatise, which is uh, about how modern architecture should be half Amerindian and half according to modern functions. It should be a condensation. That was our real background. But you see, they loved this because everything was building toward it. The step backs, the art deco de decoration, the richness, the exotic quality of all this. And also the wonderful quality of these buildings, the richness, the power of that thing rises. Now, the other thing was that the most important sort of form giver, form suggester of the 20s, also loved it. And this is uh, Hugh Ferris. And when he brings out his book, The Metropolis of Tomorrow, in 1929, his frontispiece is this, and he calls it Buildings Like Mountains. Buildings out of mountains. Now, exactly, that's exactly what these were, intended to be mountains connecting the earth with the sky and going back in stages, sacred mountains here. And he sees that, and he imitates it in his forms, and, and he draws for most of the other architects. And what time is it, gentlemen? It's time for me to stop, isn't it? Is it a quarter of? Sorry. I'll pick it up next time. Thank you. It's so, funny, uh, people, when I talk to, to popular audiences, the thing they get angry about is the Maya connection. They don't want to see it. 
They hate the idea. They think it must, they must be making it up. But there's nothing more documented than this. Anyway, we'll talk about it next time.